Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And good morning to our satellite locations around the college. Uh, we're not ignoring you. Wish we could all be together. We're doing the best we can here. Um, what I want to do is walk you through a line of thinking that I've been exploring. I've been examining the practical aspects of character within the context of the profession. And that's what I want to talk about today. Um, turns out the lens through which you view your roles and responsibilities has a direct impact on how you come to decisions and make ethical choices. And you go, hey, John, that's great. What a blinding flash of the obvious. Thank you for that. We're going to break that apart a little bit as we go through this. I came across this quote from the vice chief, who, who you, you will hear from this afternoon, and I found this particularly relevant to this discussion. Doing what is right. Hmm, seems obvious. I bet there have been many times in your careers where folks have told you, do the right thing. You know what the right thing is, go do that, right? It's obvious, do the right thing. It's black and white, what's so hard about that? Do the right thing. Do I need to explain it any further? You know what the right thing is, go do that. Do you really? Right for whom? You? Your shipmates or your compadres? For the organization, is it right for the mission? Is it right for the organization? Is it right for the institution? Is it right for all of those things? What is right, right? That's what we want to explore today. That's why I think this is so important. That's why I emphasize the right, because we got to find out what right is. Now, there's other dimensions to this statement by the vice chief. And rules are important, but doing what is right is imperative. So the implication might be that in order to do what is right, you may have to break a rule. Uh-oh. <laughs> Wait a minute. That doesn't sound right. Do what's right. Break a rule? That's what we want to explore here a little bit today. This is where, as professionals, in the profession of arms, at least, the requirement for you to exercise professional judgment with discretion becomes so important. So clearly, character plays a huge role in determining what right is. So I'm going to use the, the context of the US Navy uh, through the lens of the Navy Leader Development Framework. Uh, back in April, uh, when the, the Chief of Naval Operations came up here to the college and one established the College of Leadership and Ethics. But he also rolled out version 2.0 of his Navy Leader Development Framework. And in that, he really emphasized the importance of both competence and character. And this is what he was talking about. There are two lanes in which we develop our people. One is a competence lane, and one is a character lane. In the competence lane, these quotes come from him. You know, you've got to know what we're doing, clearly. Our institutions, our organizations are clearly designed and organized and, and spend money on the development of your competence, right? Everything that you've done in your careers up to this point has been largely competency-based. You're even evaluated on your performance based on competency, competency rules. Character, on the other hand, the CNO says, we've got to raise it up to, on an equal footing with competence. Well, how do we do that? He charged all of the Navy communities to come up with strategies for their leader development for their people that included deliberately developing the character of their people. That's a challenge, right? We have schools for competence all over the place. How do you develop someone's character? <laughs> hmm, let's go to a school for character development. What does that look like? What do you focus on? Well, you might focus on following rules. <laughs> Wait a minute. That doesn't seem to be enough, does it? 
Hmm. So how do we do, how, do, how has our character been developed throughout our careers? Well, typically, it's over to you to do that, right? You come into uh, your organizations with a, with a set of values that you've gained from your upbringing, from maybe your faith tradition, from your experiences, and that's what you base uh, your character on. And then the military, in, this, in our case, puts in rules and regulations to, and sets high standards, right, to modify your behavior to align with the values of the institution. And then we hold people accountable, right? That's typically the way we do that. So you're expected to follow the rules and regulations and, the, and achieve these high standards, and that helps form your character, right? That's not a bad model. I mean, we're using it. We, we produce great leaders in the military with that model. We produce leaders with character through that model. So it's not a bad model. What the CNO's saying, though, is that it's insufficient. It's not enough. He goes on to say that competence and character are so tightly intertwined that they must be strengthened together. So even though there might be two lanes in this, um, they have to be strengthened and developed because what he says is trust and confidence is the coin of the realm for us in many dimensions. All of the dimensions where you talk about trust and confidence, whether it's in the operational arena where you have the trust and confidence between commanders that can execute missions without oversight, commander's intent, or it's the trust and confidence that we earn with the with the society that we serve. So I'm gonna use um, the Navy's core values to, to try and illustrate what I'm talking about. Um, the first thing I wanna bring out, and no matter what institutional values uh, your organization has, they all have multiple dimensions to them. And if they have multiple dimensions to them, it doesn't, you don't have to stretch very far to come up with situations where those values might actually conflict. And you have to sort that out. So for the Navy, honor is one of our core values. And I particularly like this definition by retired Admiral Lawrence talking about the, taking the hard right instead of the easy wrong. Is a, is a way to define your honor. Hmm. And then the physical and moral attributes of courage. And then commitment to yourself, in this case shipmates, the Navy, the institution, the nation. Multiple dimensions to all of these. But I want to focus right now on the courage piece. And let me start off by making a couple assumptions about all of you, and I'm going to make the assumptions about our folks in the satellite locations, even though I can't see you. Let me make this assumption. <clears throat> I'm going to make the assumption that you are all people of character and integrity. Does anybody push back on that? Thank goodness. I hope so. I hope you think that you're a person of character and integrity. Now let me make another assumption. Let me further assume that you'll always do the right thing. Any pushback on that? Person of character, you're gonna push back? Why not? Not always? At least you're honest. Good for you. You, you do know you're in the minority here. <laughs> so just, I'm just saying, but that's okay. There may be people in the satellite locations where everybody's raising their hand, you know, I don't know. Very good. But for the most part, right, we all consider ourselves people of character and integrity and we'll always do the right thing. All right, so let me ask this question. In respect to courage, which is more difficult to exercise, physical courage or moral courage? Moral courage. It's a, it's a no-brainer. It's hard. But here's the real question. If you are all people of character and integrity that will always do the right thing, why is moral courage so hard? 
Uh-oh. That's what I normally get. Well, that's a good question. <laughs> right? That's what we're trying to explore here today. Moral courage is hard, and yet I'm a person of character to tell me I always do the right thing. Well, if that's true, then moral courage is a cinch because you're always going to do the right thing, but we know that it's not. Some conflict here we've got to try and resolve. But when you think about it, the extremes of both physical and moral courage, right? The extreme exercise of physical courage can result in your death. What's the extreme of moral courage? Uh, you, your career is over, right? And yet it's more difficult to exercise. I mean, that's a lot to, to think about. And yet we feel that way strongly. So that got me thinking about character. There are a lot of definitions out there about character. I came up with my own. I'm a pretty simple guy, so my definition is going to be pretty simple. If you want a really good definition of character, I, have, I would commend you to the Army. They've written absolutely wonderful documents about character. Well, here's mine. Not very self-satisfying. Hey, John, that should be a little longer. Maybe a little, few more words, make say more stuff. Uh, no, that's what I use. And I'll explain that. Um, turns out, our character is revealed in the actions we take in every day in the environment that we're in. And those actions are based on what we value at that particular time. And that reveals our character. That's what I'm saying. And it turns out that environment and the context in which you lead and make decisions has a tremendous impact on how your character is revealed through the actions you take. And so when we talk about character and integrity, the field of moral psychology is starting to challenge those notions. You know, a lot of times we think of our character and integrity as armor that we wear. I'm a person of character and integrity. I will always do the right thing because I'm a person of character and integrity. So it's armor, plating. In any situation, I got it, right? Folks in moral psychology say, well, no, nah, no, nah, not so much. I'm going to try to convince you that the environment that you are in has more to do with your behavior than with that, that, chink, that, that body of armor that you call character and integrity. Let me prove that to you. To do that, I'm going to use the work of Dan Ariely. He's a professor down at Duke University. This is the book he wrote called The Honest Truth About Dishonesty, and I recommend it to you. It's an easy read. But what Dan Ariely does is he studies cheating. That's pretty cool. So let me give you an example of some of the experiments he has done. He's up at Carnegie Mellon University up in Pittsburgh. And he has a group of students in a room. And the assignment is he's going to give them 10 math problems to solve. And these are math problems, by the way, that a history major like me can solve. Okay, So they're easy. Right? The problem is he doesn't give them enough time to solve the problems. So it goes like this. Bell rings, answer as many questions as you can. When the bell rings again, put your pencil down, take your answer sheet, take it to the front of the room, put it in a shredder, take a dollar for every correct answer. Do people cheat? What do you think? There's no accountability. Yeah, people cheat. And what he found and the reason he knows this is because, well, he cheated, because, because the shredder only shred the outside of the answer sheet, so he knows how many questions people got right. <laughs> so Ariely cheats to find out about cheating, okay? But I guess that's okay. Um, it turns out, thankfully, most, cheat, pe most people only cheat a little. Some people cheat a lot, some people don't cheat, but most people cheat a little. That's probably the good news in this. 
that we're usually we're pretty good, we're, as people, we're pretty good. But we don't mind cheating a little bit. And it goes kind of like this, right? You're, you're cruising along in a test, you get to question four, you're just starting on question five, you can see that you know the answer, the bell rings, and you can't, but you can't answer it, right? You can't put it down on paper. But you say to yourself, wait a minute, I knew the answer. What's the harm? Who's gonna know? I'm just gonna down and shred it. I'm not, right? I can still feel good about myself because I knew the answer. What's the big deal, right? He calls this our personal fudge factor. And we all have it. We all have personal fudge factors. It allows us to feel good about ourselves when we do something that perhaps isn't as good as we think it should be, right? So, the example I always use in here is, um, I'm gonna make another assumption about all of you, is that you consider yourself to be a law-abiding citizen. I know I certainly do. I pay my taxes. I don't violate the law. I'm a good person. I'm a good citizen. Yet I have absolutely no qualms about exceeding the speed limit every day. Right? <laughs> uh -huh. Right? So why do we speed? There's so many great answers, right? If you've driven around Rhode Island long enough, it's simple. If you drive the speed limit in this state, you're going to kill somebody. There was even a law in the state that if you're driving the speed limit in the passing lane, you're going to get a ticket. Yikes. Everybody's doing it. Also, I've got a I'm a pretty skilled driver. My car has all these lane control things and radar cruise control. I'm good to go. And a speed limit's a guideline anyway. And what most people have told me, so this must be true, that you're not going to get a ticket up to seven miles over the speed limit. I remember that. All right, now. 72 and a 65 is okay. But what happens if you're driving along, middle lane, 95, 672 miles an hour, and somebody blows by you going 90. You go, oh, look at that guy. <laughs> right? That guy's a hazard. He's going to kill somebody. That's your first thought. Your second thought is, great, because the cop's going to pull him over and not me. <laughs> Usually that's my second thought anyway. But you, right? So we judge others by their actions, right? We judge ourselves by our intent. So that guy blowing by us, we have no idea why that person's going 90 miles an hour. It could be an emergency. It could be on the way to the hospital. He's got to get, you know, whatever. We don't know that. We just go, whoa. I don't like that guy, right? <laughs> but we're doing 72 and a 65, and I'm a good guy. I'm a good person, right? Personal fudge factor. So let's go back to um, Ariely for a minute. So he runs this experiment again with a different group of students. Only this time he has an actor in the room. Ha, ha, ha. So when the bells at bell start to start the exercise, the actor stands up and says, I've solved them all, grabs his answer sheet, puts it in the shredder, takes 10 bucks, walks out to class. The question for you, does cheating go up or down? Up. This is your first introduction to the War College answer. It depends. <laughs> It actually depends on the sweatshirt the actor is wearing. If he's wearing a Carnegie Mellon sweatshirt, this is a university where this is happening at, cheating goes up. Any ideas why? It's one of us, right? It's just the way we do things around here. It must be okay. Think about, think about the organizations you've come from. The, the culture and the climate of the organization you've been in. Did you modify your behavior to that culture and climate? You bet you did. You did things the way things are done around here. Now, if the actor 
is wearing a Pitt sweatshirt, which is a university across town, cheating goes way down. In fact, it goes below the fudge factor. Why is that? We don't want to be like them, right? They're bad people. Isn't that amazing? So think about that. The, the, the environment that you set for your organization has a lot to do with the way people behave. And you can do very minor things to change people's behavior. And let me give you a couple examples. The first example is what Ariely did. He did the same type of a, a test up at MIT with a group of students, except on the answer sheet at the top, there was a statement that essentially said, you know, I will well and faithfully answer these questions to the best of my ability in accordance with the MIT honor code, sign your name. Cheating went down. MIT doesn't have an honor code. <laughs> hmm. Cheating goes down. He also tried an experiment with people to say, before they answered the test, I want you to think about the Ten Commandments. Just think about them. They took the test, cheating went down. Now, let me, I'll give you another example that will just blow your mind. At least it blows my mind every time I think about it. They did an experiment over in London in some office building over there. And they had a, a tea service, an honor system. You go in, make a cup of tea, put some money in a cup, and psh, out you go. They, could, they had a hidden camera so they could record behavior. And this is where it gets crazy. So on the days when they had a cup with flowers painted on it for the collection of the money, the donations, they got very little donations. <laughs> So they changed it up. They painted a set of eyes on the cup. <laughs> People put money in the cup. Now that has got to be the dumbest thing I have ever heard in my life. Do you agree? I mean, is that nuts? Would, would a set of painted eyes change your behavior? Come on. A cup with a p stupid, except I tried it here. <laughs> Because I didn't believe it, I said, I got to see, I got to try it. We have offices up uh, Loose Hall, uh, up in the third deck, and there's classrooms up there. Some of you will enjoy those classrooms this fall. And we had a coffee mess. And students come in and make themselves a cup of coffee at breaks. And, and oh, we didn't mind. We weren't getting any money. <laughs> so I said, OK, put a cup out there, paint some eyes on it. Let's see what happens. You folks are putting money in the cup. <laughs> Is that nuts? Little changes in the environment will change your behavior. I'm a person of character and integrity, right? right? But you'll do all kinds of crazy stuff based on the environment that you're in. That's the issue here. That's the issue here. So for you, thinking as a leader, what is the environment that I'm creating for my people, right? Exhortations to people to say, live by our core values, or be a person of character and integrity. You're wasting your breath. <laughs> Instead, what are the values you're trying to, what is the environment you're creating in your organization? Have you ever been told any time in your life in some organization, I don't care what it takes, just get it done? Oh boy, right? Or, if you can't get it done, I'll find somebody who can. Uh, yep, yep. <laughs> right? Changes your behavior. Maybe in a good way, maybe not in such a good way. And yet we tell people, be people of character and integrity. If any of you, particularly our Army brethren, if you've uh, read Dr. Lenny Wong's study on lying to ourselves on the Army, if you haven't, I commend that to you institutionally, and I wouldn't just limit this to the Army, I think it's certainly true of our Navy, we force people to lie. And yet we want you to be people of character and integrity. Always do the right thing. Think about that environment. So think about it for your people. Also think about it 
in the environment that you're in and what's, what's causing you to modify your behavior. That's the trip. Okay. This, this simple diagram, again, I told you I'm a pretty simple guy. I have a simple diagrams. Um, it's a visual representation of the domains in which we make decisions. And I took it from an article that appeared in the Atlantic Monthly in July of 1924. We study old stuff here sometimes. Um, and the, the article is entitled Law and Manners. You can Google this and read it for yourself. Um, it's, uh, it, it is a, uh, uh, someone wrote down a, a speech given by Lord John Moulton. And you go, who's that guy? Well, I don't know, except that he was pretty influential in the British government before and during World War I. And he wrote this, this thing about law and manners and talked about these three domains, which I think is really pertinent to our discussion here this morning. So I'm going to go through um, all of these briefly. First is the positive law domain. This is domain of compliance, bureaucracy, the low trust environment, right? Why do we have laws because, and rules? We put rules in place mainly because there's a trust issue here. We can hold people accountable to these things. This is from the vice chief's statement where rules are important, right? Rules are important. We have to have rules and regulations that govern actions, right? So people know what to do. So it's important. However, there's a couple problems with this domain. The first is, you put enough rules in place, you take away people's ability for self-reliance. And I'll give you the best example that I've been exposed to recently. It comes from the Army, and I apologize to our Army brethren. So you can tell me if this is true or not. But I heard back when that, uh, that phone game, the Pokemon game, I don't know if any of you played Pokemon, when you, walking around and, right? They've actually put rules in place for using Pokemon on a bait, on an army post. And I thought to myself, really? Really? We're gonna govern every single aspect of someone's behavior down to Pokemon? <laughs> really? <laughs> hmm, so what happens when our people come upon situations in which either the rule doesn't apply or there is no rule, well, we say, do the right thing. <laughs> Exercise judgment. And I would say, based on what? If you tried to govern everyone's life with every single rule and regulation you could come up with. Doesn't compute, right? Here's the other one, which is probably uh, more of a problem. It's this sense that if I just follow the rules and the regulations, I've done my duty. I've done enough. I would argue, no, you haven't. Again, go back to the vice chief's statement. Rules are important. Doing what is right is imperative. So just following the rules, it's not enough. You haven't just done your duty. All right, the free choice domain, which is the opposite end of the spectrum. This is the fun domain. This is, wow, spontaneity, originality, energy. This is where innovation happens, right? Because you can fail and it's okay. You can be really creative. This is an awesome domain. You can do anything you want. Woo -hoo. Yeah, right, huh? If there isn't a rule or a reg to govern the activity, do it. Go ahead. You have complete freedom. Now, how do you think that works in the military, <laughs> right? Probably not so much, right? We have this thing called good order and discipline. Mm, kind of butts up against this free choice domain, but that's the domain that is out there. It's a domain that many of our people that come into the military come from in many cases. I want to focus most, though, on the domain in the middle. This domain of obedience to the unenforceable. I love that phrase. Lord John Moulton. Boy, he was a good writer. So this is the domain of duty, obligation, selfless service. 
we're self-regulating in this domain. We, take, we hold each other accountable. This is the domain of the profession. This is a high trust domain. So this is where the CNO's coin of the realm exists and in this domain. And this is where doing what is right is imperative. It's also where you take the hard right instead of the easy wrong. So these three domains exist. The one that we're most focused on when we talk about character in the profession of arms is the domain of obedience to the unenforceable, except it gets pressure put on it from both sides. From the positive law domain, it gets pressure all the time. If, if something goes wrong in the military, we have basically three ways to fix the problem. We fire the leadership, mandate more training, institute a new policy, <laughs> right? And the combination of those three things somehow is to fix for everything, for everything that's gone wrong, right? And so that builds up over time more and more rules and regulations and things not to do, which takes away from or in, it puts pressure on that domain of obedience to the unenforceable, or it's on you to do what's right on you to do what's right when no one's looking domain. That's taken away. From the pre free choice domain, the pressure typically comes from uh, situations in which we lower our standards or things that perhaps weren't okay before. Well, maybe they are okay now because we've lowered our standards. Pushes against the domain of obedience to the unenforceable. For the profession to flourish, the job of military professionals is to do everything in their power to strengthen the boundaries between those positive law and free choice domain and strengthen those boundaries or in fact push them back, push them back. So the domain of obedience to the unenforceable truly is the largest of the three. I've been talking a lot about Professions, so I thought, well, let me just make sure that everybody has an understanding of what a profession really is. So I'm going to walk through what are con um, historically considered attributes of a profession. First, of course, is providing a unique service to the society it serves. So if you use the examples of uh, law and medicine and religion, you can say those professions provide justice, health, and salvation, right? Things that the society can't do for itself. For the profession of arms, we can say that we provide security, right? So it meets the criteria of the unique and vital service to the society. And it requires expert knowledge. And that expert knowledge needs to be applied with discretion and judgment. And so your year here at the Naval War College is all about enhancing your expert knowledge. That's what this year is about. So that you can leave here and apply all the things that you've learned in your new roles with discretion and judgment that has been enhanced. Trust of the society is earned, and I would argue has to be earned almost every day. Now, for over 15 years, the military in the United States has, has had and enjoyed very high trust with the American people. That's why many of you have been greeted with people that come up to you that you don't know and say, thank you for your service. For those of you that are not as old as me, there was a time when people didn't come up to you and, and thank you for your service, they would call you a baby killer throw eggs at you. So the trust of the society can be fleeting and has to be constantly earned. Right now we're in a very good place, but we can't let our guard down. We have to continually get the trust of the society, keep earning it. And we do that because 
we take our responsibilities for policing ourselves very seriously. We have a uniform code of military justice. We decide who comes into the profession, who gets qualified in profession, who promotes in the profession, and who leaves the profession. The profession does that, not some entity outside the profession. And by doing that, we're granted significant autonomy to carry out our roles. So the military, in fact, meets all of the characteristics of a profession. However, like any profession, it's also embedded in a bureaucracy. And up here, I've used, uh, I've taken uh, a chart that was created by Dr. Don Snyder, a retired Army colonel, um, in a book he wrote, The Future of the Army Profession. And I kind of modified it a little to represent more of a Navy flavor to it, but it's essentially the same type of chart. Um, but with any profession, a bureaucracy is necessary. And if you look at the functions of, a, of the profession of the bureaucracy, the, the, the hope is that even though they may be different, that they complement each other. That's the goal. It doesn't always work that way. I would say that it's probably fair to say that, um, that much of what governs your daily activity uh, comes from the bureaucracy. So its influence tends to be more visible. I have, over the years, taken this chart, I've taken the title profession and bureaucracy off of it, and I've sh showed it to senior leaders. And my question to them was, which column do you see yourself in? And the second question is, which column do you see the institution in? In this case, what I show is to, to Navy officers. So which column do you see the Navy in? And the answers I get are, are kind of interesting. The answer is, for most people is, well, I like to see myself as this member of the profession, but I find myself most of the time in the side of bureaucracy. I mean, when you think about why most people join the military, is it they, do they join it for the things that are on the bureaucracy side? I, I suspect not, right? Most of the reasons that people give for joining the military is because they want to be part of something larger than themselves. That's the profession side of the things. So there is this natural tension between the profession and the bureaucracy. And how you view what you do tells which side of, the, of this chart plays the largest in your life, right? And how you then make decisions. So again, let me go back to your Naval War College education. If you're looking at this year through the lens of the profession, you might say, I am grateful for the investment my institution has made in me to increase my expert knowledge. And I have a professional obligation to apply myself to this year because I owe it to pay its payback to the profession. You might look at through the lens of the bureaucracy and say, I got my JPME education done, check in the box, I'm done, right? But that's not saying one is good and one is bad. This is where that they are complementary. Yeah, you get your JPME credit, that's a good thing, and you also increase your expert knowledge. That's the way the profession and bureaucracy should be working together. It doesn't always happen that way. But it makes an impact on how you approach this year, I would argue. The last chart I would show you is, uh, is this one. And, and again, a simple chart, but explains uh, the development of professionals over time. You know, we bring people into the military, we, we give them rules and regulations to follow, and then we expect them to obey those rules and regulations. And so we elicit from them compliance behavior. And what we say that that's really the moral minimum here. I showed this chart several years ago to a, a Navy captain who was very open and honest with me, and he said, John, 
you know, I just realized I've spent my whole career in that quadrant. It's what I do. I didn't think about this. So hopefully as you gain experience over time, as you become more committed to the institution, you start to develop a, a, a professional identity that aligns with the values of the institution. And that professional identity then allows you to exercise your discretion and judgment aligned with the values of the organization it helps you do the right thing. But only if you look at it in that way. And that's how we get ethical leaders. That's what bolsters up the doing, the, the, the right thing being imperative. Uh, and, and why is this important? I would, I'm going to refer to Admiral Stockdale because um, um, he talked about military leaders having a moral obligation to not only make good choices, but to put themselves and others at risk. Therefore, they must be able to justify both to themselves and to others the potential cost in lives and resources of their choices in both a moral context and in terms of accomplishment of worthwhile objectives. That's why this is so important, because of what you do. So I have a few concluding thoughts. Doing what is right is imperative and taking the hard right instead of the easy wrong. And I would say the way that you can enhance your ability to do that is to view who you are and what you do primarily through the lens of the profession. Why do I say that? Because if you can do that, you take the me out of the situation because it's not about you. I was talking to an officer about a month ago and we were having this conversation and she was telling me about an experience that she had in a command in which she was something bad happened and she wanted to say something but her line of thinking went this way I was new to the command I was a young 05 I was a woman therefore I didn't say anything think how much that would change if you took I out of that equation and looked at it through the lens of the profession. I would submit your character would be enhanced. So, obedience to the domain of the unenforceable is the goal. And, and to further that goal is expand the influence of that domain in everything that you do. And that the profession needs to tell the bureaucracy just how much bureaucracy it needs. It must be the dominant force here for the profession of arms to be successful. As a former president of the Naval War College was fond of saying, only a profession can win a war, a bureaucracy cannot. And so, in concluding, I would say, if you want to enhance the character of your people, then you must strengthen the profession. And with that, I would open up to any comments or questions from anyone. Yes, sir. We have a we got mics here somewhere. Morning, sir. I'm Navy Commander Ioannis Agrodimos from Greece. Uh, my question is: You talked uh, about characters versus about profession versus uh, bureaucracy. Now, my question has to do with character versus profile, because we live in an era full of social media, the era of yeah. uh, everybody want to build up his own good profile and spotless profile. And if, we, if we're evaluating our personnel, which uh, will bring the next generation of leaders, how are we going to protect these, some people that might but follow the rules, don't break regulations, but don't have the perfect profile, such as being, uh, we know, being smokers, or drinkers, or even womanizers, no offense, but, 
and the history is full of leaders who changed the, the flow of history and, had, and didn't have a good profile. How could we, if we want to enhance their profile or protect them against others who follow the bureaucracy and have the perfect profile to follow a great career? Isn't Thank that you. the challenge that we all have, right? Pretty much. And if I understand your question right, um, there are a lot of um, societal pressures on our people. There are a lot of institutional pressures on, uh, on all of you. The environment that you lead today is different than the environment I led in when I was on active duty. There's no question about that. I talked to a Navy IG several, several years ago that said, uh, if you get a hotline complaint against you, even if it's not substantiated, that never, that never goes away. That's a different world. If you allow me to make, to make it a bit harder, it's uh, the profile of the uh, people that earns the, the trust of the society, or at least contributes to it. So you, are you talking about that the society, that because of societal changes, and that changes the profile of people coming in? Is that what you're talking about? Isn't that a question? Um, I, you know, we've, we've looked a, a lot at that. We've looked a lot of it, uh, at least in terms of our Navy, and there's a lot of evidence, of course, that um, uh, the people coming into the, to the Navy today are certainly influenced by the society. But the good news is they respond just as effectively to the things that we try to instill in them in being a member of the profession as anybody ever did. That's what, that's what the people at our recruit training facilities tell us. Their, motivated, their motivation for joining, their motivation for being in the military, um, it, it, it is, spans society's influence. It, it, it is uh, consistent with how people have come into the military for years and years and years. That's encouraging, that you can still provide people a set of values in some cases, we know that some, some of the people that have come into the military are devoid of, of, of values in, in some cases, or their values are certainly not aligned with our military values, but they're responsive to growing and developing those values over time, by and large. Yes, sir. <coughs> Uh, Lieutenant Commander Saad from Djibouti Navy. First, I thank you, your great presentation. I just a question. You have been in leadership domain a long time during your career. As you know, leadership is a very difficult job. Leader must accept responsibility and failure. However, some leaders deny the failure. To save institution or nation, what is the best way to convince your leadership? To convince leadership about accepting failure? About his failure, because he yeah. say you are, yeah. he say you are subordinate and you want to convince him that is not right, but he didn't accept this is, because he say he accept his responsibility, but he didn't accept a failure. It's a, a real challenge. It's a real challenge. If it's a challenge in your name, I guarantee it's a challenge in, across the services in the United States. There's no question about it. Um, I can speak at least in terms of the navies, which is what I study. And over time, um, that has become more and more of a problem. In fact, we have seen where even decision making has moved up the chain of command over time. Um, that, that would illustrate a trust deficit and a low tolerance for failure. The good news, I think, is that at least for the Navy, and I think it's true for the other services, our senior leadership has recognized that. So when you read documents like the Navy Leader Development Framework and the CNO's design for maintaining maritime superiority, it puts a high value on we need to enhance trust and confidence. So that means we have to let people act, make mistakes, and move on. Um, we still have a long way to go. To, to realize that aspirational aspect of those documents. But at least the senior leadership certainly 
um, in line with that thinking and trying to move in that direction. I think the, I wouldn't be surprised if the vice chief talked about that this afternoon. And I would, I would encourage you to ask him that question. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, good morning, sir. Leader of Office, Malaysia, NSC. Um, leadership competency and military are interrelated. My question is to which extent the leadership can influence competency and how the leadership may influence the competency itself. I'm not sure I understood your question. I'm sorry. Could you repeat that, please? Yes, sir. Uh, leadership, competency, and military are interrelated. My question is to which extent the leadership can influence competency and how the leadership may influence the competency itself. The competency of self? Is, yeah, I mean the competency of your man because leadership is between leaders and followers. So how the leaders may use his leadership to influence his followers' competency. I think, like I said earlier, I think the most important thing is to establish the, the sort of environment or climate within the organization that not only encourages but promotes the development of not only your people's competency but their character together is the key. And, and, and a lot of times we, you get so wrapped up in the issues of the day um, the task that you're trying to uh, get through, answering the mail up the chain of command, you can lose sight of that. Uh, expediency um, it can be uh, a great threat to that. And so I think for the leader, again, is to focus a lot on that environment across the command to ensure that uh, you're eliciting uh, from your people uh, the sorts of behaviors that encourage their development in both competence and character. So it gets into the way you train, for example. How realistic is the training that you're willing to do? In some cases, uh, realistic training can be quite dangerous. And if you're in a, a kind of a risk avoidance type of person, you might not want to go there. And if you don't go there, well, then you're not going to develop the competence of your people to the degree that you probably should, as an example. I think we have time for one more. Hey, Michael, down here in front. Thanks. Sir, so I'm Captain Rohan Joseph from the Sri Lanka Navy. I was wondering, we have seen politicians, some great military leaders, uh, once they reach a particular level of their life or career, you see them basically screw them up, right? Now, having such so much of uh, uh, openness or exposure to leadership and qualities and ethics and all of these things, why aren't they, you know, sure when they see like, oh, I'm going, I'm heading for trouble? What, why, why doesn't they, they are not aware of the, that particular situation that sparks them, that should come into their brain and tell, mm. you are, you are going to cross this line. So how, how does these great leaders fall into such a trap at the last moment and end up in real, you know? There are a lot of reasons for that, I would submit. But uh, one would certainly be uh, looking at themselves through, the, through their own lens, right? So as, they, as you get more senior, right, uh, we used to say you don't get any better looking, you know, people don't love you more, you just because of your position, right? People could become attracted to you. You get more attention to you. And the, and the danger is, is that you like it. And things become more about you than perhaps your role in the profession. You lose sight of that. That's certainly one. Um, it can also be, like I said, the environment in which you're leading can, can perhaps, um, get you down that path as well. And, and although we certainly don't know, but I think the part of the issues with the problems out in, in Seventh Fleet with Glenn Defense Marine, uh, that environment in many people uh, contributed to the decisions that they made that turned out to be illegal. 
And along the way, probably they didn't think they were doing anything all that wrong. So that's a factor. There are also people that, uh, to be quite honest, sometimes get promoted that have poor character. Right? Um, I think it's fair to say in the military that competence will trump character. That's sometimes that's a harsh statement. I, I made that statement to the CNO. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that did not go well. <laughs> but what the heck, I'm a retired guy. I mean, what can he do to me? Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> so, but when you think about it, right? Uh, and there's probably been examples of this, and I'm sure you're familiar with people that have a particular competency that the institution values greatly, but they have a character flaw. And we may overlook that character flaw until the, we get to a point where you can't overlook it anymore, and then you gotta do something, right? That was the point I was try, trying to make. Um, his statement back was, well, that's not gonna be the case anymore, okay? Yes, sir, aye, aye, sir. Oh, I'll shut up now. Um, but you get the point. So, so there are multiple dimensions to that. And, and we're all susceptible, right? We, like, remember, we judge ourselves by our intent. So we can explain away a lot of things in our behavior and still feel good about ourselves. And the more you do that over time, that slippery slope gets slipperier, and, sl and before you know it, you're, you're right there and you sit in a place where you would say, I will never be like them. And there you are. So your content, the, the, one of the things, and Gene's gonna follow me, it's a great segue, is the degree of self-awareness you have about yourself plays a huge role in this, and why we focus on it so much here at the college. I wanna thank you all for your great attention.